scriptures. If we know the Mesopotamian Apkalo story, we can read Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and say, okay, sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim, before and after the flood. Okay, we, we know what they're shooting at. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first, we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. I don't find this easy to believe. Yeah. Like, this isn't natural for me to... So I'm choosing to say, I think these biblical authors and Jesus have a way of viewing the world that they can see something that I guess I can't see. Yeah. There's something I'm blind to. In Genesis 6, 1 to 4, those four verses to us lack context. We lack the context. A literate Israelite would not have lacked the context. There's three rebellions. There's three that led to contribute to why the world is the way it is. This is where it begins. You speak truth to lies. Here we go again. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells. As we're continuing in on our series, Jesus versus the powers of the three rebellions. Our modern Western worldviews are going to be tested. We're gonna to need to open our minds and open our Bibles as we examine this information. Why is the world so messed up? Why did Jesus come to this earth? This second rebellion is really going to help us understand the answer to those questions. Who are the Nephilim? Are giants real? Did fallen angels really have sex with the daughters of men? How do we take these stories literally or figuratively as a parable? This episode is going to help us understand these questions and more. So I hope you're subscribed. I hope you're ready for another amazing episode. Let's get started. why is the world and all humanity so thoroughly wicked? What's the average Christian going to say? The fall. The fall. Okay, because that, that's what we're taught. And it's not that the answer isn't the fall. The answer is the fall plus two other things. Even the earliest Christians, the, the very beginnings of what we call sort of the, the early church or the early church fathers, they would not have said only the fall. They would have said, well, there was this thing, the fall, but they also would have said there was this thing that happened in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Genesis 6 describes the second supernatural rebellion. Some of the sons of God, members of the heavenly council, transgress the boundary between heaven and earth. Genesis 6 recorded the second supernatural rebellion. The fallen sons of God were sent to Tartarus for their transgression. Tartarus is a Greek word for the realm of the dead, what we think of as hell. They'd stay there until the day of the Lord, at the end of days. A term like fallen angels makes us think of demons like the ones Jesus cast out. But the rebels of Genesis 6 are imprisoned, so they can't be the demons Jesus encountered. So where did they come from? The answer lies in the offspring produced by the Forbidden Union between the sons of God and the women in Genesis 6. Those offspring were known as the Nephilim. They were giants. Their descendants became the giant clans Moses and Joshua battled. Jewish writers believe that demons, like those described in the Gospels, were disembodied spirits of the giants. They base this on the Bible's mention of dead Rephaim in the underworld. Jewish books like First Enoch and the Book of the Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls make that point. Genesis 6, okay, again, we're all familiar with this passage, sons of God, daughters of men. Nephilim on the earth in those days and also afterward. <clears throat> People who were reading the, these texts who were not sort of conditioned to not let them say what they plainly say, um, took a supernatural view of this. They weren't troubled, you know, by some of the questions that, that pop into our heads. You know, well, how does this work? You know, and they're, they're, they're not there. They, they, they reflexively do this. And, and two of the people that do that are Peter and Jude. So now you got a problem, which is why you'll read all sorts of exegetical gymnastics that will say things like Peter and Jude, they weren't thinking about Genesis 6. And Peter and Jude are obviously familiar with that stuff, and they're not 
flustered by it at all. They embrace it. They bring it into their text. This, it just is what it is. So you can say that Peter and Jude were wrong. I mean, you can do that. But that's, that's basically what you have to do to eviscerate or, you know, you know, cut the supernatural out of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. This is a quote from Annas, the Mesopotamian Apkalus. Now, Apkalu was a Mesopotamian. Before the flood, they were completely divine. After the flood, they're not. Okay. After the flood, they're a, for lack of a better term, they're a mixture. They're a hybrid between divine and human, and they also happen to be giants. Okay, if it gives you a little, a little idea where we're headed here. Okay, Abkalu were the, were the wise men. They are, they are cast as the culture heroes of Mesopotamia, the great divine minds that brought civilization to humans, dispensed it from, from their divine realm to humans. And this is the Mesopotamian explanation for why they're just so great. Why Mesopotamia is just so great, especially Babylon. Okay, this is why we're ahead of the game because the gods gave us all this knowledge. That's who the Apkalus were. Now the Apkalus are the ones who are going to get demonized as the sons of God and their sons, the Nephilim. And those figures in later Enochic literature appear as the Watchers and the Giants, illegitimate teachers of humankind. So Annas is saying, this is the focus point, these Apkalu guys. Greenfield in DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, if you're going to buy one reference book, about this kind of stuff, this is the one, DDD. It says this, in Mesopotamian religion, the term Apkalu, Sumerian Abgal, is used for the legendary creatures endowed with extraordinary wisdom. Seven in number, they are the culture heroes from before the flood. So we, we can look at that and we can kind of know, you know, what, what, they're sort of, what they're sort of fishing for because if we know the Mesopotamians, Abkalu's story, we can read Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and say, okay, sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim, before and after the flood. Okay, we, we know what they're shooting at. But it's the Enoch stuff that adds their punishment. And that's the stuff that Peter and Jude pick up on and winds up in Peter and Jude. And I hope you guys are enjoying this series. It has revolutionized how I look at the Bible. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, like, share, turn on the alerts for this channel. All those things help us get the message out about what God has done for this world. And we're so excited to have you here along for the journey. of Augustine forward, we have demythologized, we have stripped away, we have denied that the events of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 are supernatural. We explain away the sons of God episode with, with the daughters of men. That wasn't the case, you know, for centuries, you know, since it was written on through the intertestamental period. There's a, an individual, Julius Africanus, you know, who Prior to Augustine was the first one to sort of reject the supernatural worldview, but then Augustine did, and there are reasons why he did. He had an axe to grind, I think, with uh, some of the, the material in Judaism and in the, in the Manichees, which was the Christian sect that he joined after his conversion, that revered the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch made a big deal out of this episode. And so when they had that parting of the ways, you know, Augustine is just not mindful of the need for the passage and frankly just doesn't want to hear anything about it. And so the rest of the church, because of his stature, essentially follows suit. And so ever since we've had views of Genesis 6 that make the supernatural context of it go away. So we miss number two. And number three is we know all about the story of Babel, but we never really find Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9. Because prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, it would read that the nations were divided up according to the number of the sons of Israel. And the few people that asked, well, how does that make sense because there was no Israel, don't really have an answer. And so it tends to be largely ignored until we realize, again, through the Dead Sea Scrolls, that it really says sons of God there, and that takes us into this divine something going on. Connection here. You've got Mesopotamian, original context. You've got Old Testament. 
You've got Second Temple Period Judaism, and you've got the New Testament. And there are threads that run through all four of them. It doesn't mean they're all canonical or inspired. Again, that doesn't mean that at all. But what it means is that if you go back to Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and say, I don't like this creepy supernatural stuff. I'm just going to take that out. You break the chain. You lose the original context. And you not only lose the original context, but you pit your interpretation of Genesis 6 against what Peter and Jude are doing. And what Peter and Jude are doing, they're doing specifically because they know all the other stopping points. Watchers in its original context. I'm guessing a lot of you have never read the Enoch story. So let's just go through some of the basic parts of it. When the sons of men had multiplied, and in those days beautiful and comely daughters were born to them, and the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them, they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget for ourselves children. And Shemhaza, their chief, said to them, I fear that you will not want to do this deed, and I alone shall be guilty of a great sin. So apparently it was his idea, and he's like, I don't want to only be blamed when this thing just goes to hell in a handbasket. And they all answered him and said, Let us swear an oath. Let us all bind one another with a curse that none of us turn back from this council until we fulfill it and do this deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another with a curse. Now, you notice the, the deed again, is cast in, in sexual tones. You know, let, let's, let's go have children. But the real crime, I don't think we should miss. Again, if Unseen Realm, there's actually two views of, of sort of the supernatural perspective of Genesis 6. I don't want to leave this section without saying this. The real crime is that they want to raise up their own nations. They want, they want their own populations. They want to do, they want to they imitate God without his permission. It's kind of a Gnostic flavor to that, if you know a little bit about Gnosticism. So the, you know, this, is, this is what's going to become the, the real issue here. They were all of them 200, and they descended in the days of Jared, or Yared, onto the peak of Mount Hermon. Okay, Hermon is the key location. And they called the mountain Hermon because they swore and bound one another with a curse on it. Okay, this Hermon in Hebrew comes, is related to, it's a better way to say that same root from as Kerem, Kerem, again, the devote to destruction, to put under the ban, that sort of thing. So there's an association there with, between the terms. These and all the others with them took for themselves wives, and among them, such as they chose, they began to go into them and defile themselves through them. Again, they defiled themselves. This is a transgression of heaven and earth. To teach them sorcery and charms, and to reveal to them the cutting of roots and plants, and they conceived from them and bore to them great giants. Asael, another character, taught men to make swords of iron and weapons and shields and breastplates and every instrument of war. And there was much godlessness upon the earth, and they made their ways desolate. Shemchaza taught spells and the cutting of roots. And then you get a list of which watcher taught what to people. You, know, you get this whole list. You get signs of shooting stars, signs of the earth, signs of the sun, signs of the moon. Again, astrological stuff. They all began to reveal mysteries to their wives and to their children. As men were perishing, the cry went up to heaven. So in Enoch, even in this section and elsewhere in the book, the problem with all this isn't that we know how to make something that's made of iron or, or we use you know, eye paint to make ourselves beautiful. The problem is what people did with it. It corrupted them. So it, 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 it takes the problem of, of lust and makes it worse. It takes the problem of just any technology and makes it worse. People began to use things for, for self-destruction, for destruction of their fellow man, that sort of thing. So this is what the passage is going through. In a nutshell, what Enoch, first Enoch is saying here is, look, we know we had this thing the fall, and we know people are sinners, but they consistently blame the watchers for teaching people how to be even better sinners. Okay, and in other words, giving them more tools to destroy themselves. In Mesopotamian thought, though, there's a story that, that is the backstory to all this. It's a story of, of a group of divine beings called the Apkalu. 
Now, right away, you have, to, you have to think like a Mesopotamian and think like an Israelite. Israelites are your, you know, your biblical crowd, followers of Yahweh, at least ostensibly. And the, Mes- the Mesopotamians are followers of you know, any number of gods. Marduk is the big one, you know, when this gets written. He's the lead deity. So you've got Israel, Mesopotamia, you know, good and evil, all that stuff going on. Well, the Mesopotamian story of the flood includes the idea of supernatural beings coming to earth and cohabitation. But in their version, it's a good thing. This is why Babylon is known for its immorality, certainly its idolatry, for its dark arts. Okay, they were an empire. But those are good things because we're Babylon and we're great. There's no one like us. We are the top dog of civilization. And what the Babylonians wanted people to know is the reason we're so wonderful and so awesome and so unbeatable is because the gods helped us create Babylon. They give the gods credit. And in the Apkalu story, the Apkalu are thought of as culture heroes by the Mesopotamians, the great civilizers of their civilization, the ones who taught the Babylonians all sorts of things to build their power. So they're heroes, they're good guys. These seven sages, there are seven of them, were created by other gods in the abyss. That ought to ring a bell. Okay? They're created in the abyss. They, one of their jobs was to ensure the correct functioning of heaven and earth. They had great power, great knowledge, and they're gonna teach humans things ostensibly to create civilization. But again, the Jews look at this and go, this is horrible. We shouldn't have random bloodshed. We shouldn't have immorality. We shouldn't be worshiping other gods. We shouldn't be doing any of this garbage. But if you're a Babylonian, you're like, yeah, sign me up for that. The wisdom taught by the Apkalu to the Babylonians corresponds precisely to the forbidden knowledge that you'll see listed in Enoch. That's not a coincidence. Again, negative view, positive view. The Apkalu, they also, archeologists have discovered little figurines because the Apkalu, again, they're viewed as good guys. They're not viewed as sinister demonic figures by the Babylonians. They would make figures of the Apkalu and bury them in foundations of buildings to protect the building, you know, from whatever the Babylonians didn't like. And their name for those sculptures was Matsare in Akkadian. It means watchers. That's not a coincidence. Again, that's Enoch's term for the sons of God who fell before the flood. It's not a coincidence. He's getting it from Babylonian material. The higher gods in the Babylonian story one day, is the Apkalu are kind of mid, mid-level deities. You know, they have important jobs, but they're not the ones who, who make the decisions. They're not the ones who call the shots. They just do stuff. They're real smart and do stuff. So the higher gods decide, you know, we're kind of sick of humans. You know, you read Enuma Elish or the Gilgamesh epic or something like that, you're gonna get this story. You know, we're kind of sick of, of humans. They make a lot of noise. You know, they, they just, you know, it, this was just a bad idea. So, you know what, we're gonna get rid of them. We're gonna send a flood and wipe them out. And then the gods, you know, high five each other and ah, great idea, you know what? Let's just get rid of them. Well, the Apkalu hear this and they're like, you gotta be kidding. I mean, we've invested a lot of time in these people. You know, we've taught them all sorts of things. How in the world, I mean, all that work is gonna be lost if we just, you know, if, if they just get destroyed. So they decide, well, okay, we can think of a way to sort of transmit our knowledge to human survivors of the flood, and then we can sort of start up again. All our work will not be lost. Now, the Era Epic, which is a Mesopotamian t- text, is a key source. For In the this. days before the Great Flood, the Lord God had sent down to Earth some 200 entities from his angelic entourage. Watchers, they were called. 
appropriately named for their divine purpose. And God said to these angels, Go down to earth, oversee my mortal children, watch them and guide them from a distance, but never interfere with their affairs. Altogether, against better judgment, they descended upon the mortal women and took them for wives, impregnated them with their seed and shared with them the secrets of heaven. And it was Azazel, a high-ranking watcher, who went a step further and taught the men of mankind how to fight, taught them how to make weapons, and taught them to wage war on each other. Magic was disseminated from the lips of the watchers, as was the forbidden knowledge of the heavens and the untold wisdom of the angels. With such an intervention, the world turned to chaos. Wars were waged, rapes were committed, and the appetite of the Watchers overthrew the societal balance that mankind had so carefully cultivated. But this was only Context. the beginning. Okay, now that you sort of have the, the, the Enoch story in your head, where does it come from? It is a response to the, the episode that we find in Mesopotamian literature associated with the Flood. The biblical stuff, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, this whole weird episode, is a response to something that the Mesopotamians wrote about and believed and thought it was great, thought it was good. The Israelites thought it was wicked and evil. So there's an opposition there. And so Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is in the Bible to tell the Israelites that these events that preceded the flood were not good, they were evil. And it's gonna ripple out into biblical history in all sorts of ways to sort of make that case. It's, the story centers on the Apkalu. The Apkalu then were the wise divine beings from the abyss, from the underworld, the place opposite the heavens. They were responsible for maintaining the correct balance between heaven and earth. That was the will of the greater gods. And they possessed knowledge from the divine world that sort of made heaven and earth tick. Again, they knew lots of stuff. The scribes of Babylon living after the flood took great pains to establish the notion that their own knowledge, you know, what we scribes know, and therefore the greatness of Babylon. This is why we're so smart, and this is why Babylon's so great. Why? Because we, our knowledge has been inherited from the Apkalu. You see, you know, in this book, uh, the last note there, you may have not have known this, but Gilgamesh is actually mentioned by name in something called the Book of the Giants from Qumran. The Book of the Giants is not part of First Enoch, but it is described by scholars as Enochian material because a lot of the content of the Book of Giants you can also find in the Book of First Enoch. And there, there are a couple other, other giants named there as well in connection with the flood before and after, so on and so forth. But Gilgamesh is actually in there. So th just that one line, I just want to pause here a second, just that one text tells you that the Jews of this period were reading Mesopotamian stuff. Because you don't just start writing a book and, oh, I need a book, I need a name for this giant. What should I call him? What should I, oh, Gilgamesh. Well, that sounds good. Where'd that pop into my, no, that isn't how it happens. They're reading Mesopotamian material. They had inherited Mesopotamian stuff. It's part of their framework. It's part of their, the scholars would call, cognitive frame of reference. And they could tell, they knew, because they were familiar with the material, they could look back at Genesis 6, 1 to 4 and say, oh yeah, we know what's going on there. We know what that's about. And again, it, they, they write about what that's about in books like the Book of the Giants, books like First Enoch. Again, this is all a matrix of ideas. And the, and the reason, again, it's unfamiliar to us, it's because we're not allowed to read that other stuff. <laughs> um, if you did, you would just, the lights would just go on in different places as you, you know, expose yourself to material. these rebel spiritual beings who participate. They're called the um, sons of Elohim, or the sons of God in our English translations. Um, uh, they're sometimes called the powers. They're the hosts of heaven. Principalities. Principalities. And then... You have demons um, in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right? I, actually, that word appears in the Hebrew Bible, shadim. Yeah. Um, so, and what these are, are beings who are working on an individual and corporate level to participate and aggravate the cosmic rebellion, resulting in the world that you and I. It's one seed. Blood. It's one seed. 
The, the promise given on page 3 in Genesis 3.15 is that there's another a human seed who will, who will not, not only not give in to spiritual evil, but will overcome and defeat it at its source. Yep. Like, deal take, with the real problem. Deal with the real problem at its root. Um, and, and then this whole human lineage that you follow gets traced on through Abraham, and he's pretty awesome except when he's not acting, when he's not acting like a snake Aren't we all totally when he's not deceiving and lying mm -hmm. and abusing immigrants he's pretty wow. good when and his descendants are no better <laughs> right jacob jacob's main name means deceiver yep um and then the sons of israel the strugglers those who struggle with el those who struggle wow. with god that's what israel means struggles with god and so the story goes on and you're just like oh moses he's pretty good except when he's not David, he's pretty good, except when he's... And so you leave the Hebrew Bible going, you know what we need around here? We need a new human <laughs> who won't give in to spiritual evil, um, who will somehow overcome the evil one, but also in a way to rescue the evil the people who are captive yeah, to Babylon. To the evil one. To the evil one, and it's social manifestation in Babylon. And or would have been Roman Empire. That's right, Babylon Testament. becomes a, a symbol yep. to refer to any and all uh, human cultures that turn mm -hmm. them, their so values. Nazi Germany is God. Babylon totally. and the Roman Empire is That's Babylon. That's right, and America's Babylon. I mean, yep. all the, if, 100%. Totally. So you walk to page one of the New Testament and you see Jesus declaring the kingdom of God, that God is taking back his rule of the world through a, div a merging of the divine and human. Yep. Are you, are we, I mean, which has been the storyline. Totally. Yeah, that's right. That's what all the, of a sudden the incarnation is like. Yeah, well, that's yeah, right. Of course. That's exactly right. So the, the this is what really I began to open be, open my eyes to this is there is so much I couldn't account for in the story yeah. of the Gospels within a materialist, non-supernatural world. Yeah, is it Luke's line, the reason the Son of Man came is to destroy the works of the devil. <laughs> like that, like that's the reason. He told, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, and so Jesus, it's crystal clear to Jesus that his enemy isn't human kingdoms. And Jerusalem, the holy city of David, is being run by people who have all corrupt. given in yep. to participating in the Roman power system. And so so what Jesus does was he, he starts this right, this populist cell movement in the villages of Galilee. Yeah, no, he walks into a village and spiritual evil freaks out. Yeah. Um, the stories of Jesus' exorcisms, his healings, his healings are often yes. freeing people. Yes, from, there's a blurred from, line, from right, between evil. exorcism and the healing. And we might separate those, healing versus exorcism. It's the same it's the same activity. And it's, just, it's totally paired with integrating Matthew and the prostitutes and the sinners into God's family. Wow. That, and, and healing those who are impure and bodies riddled with skin disease and decay who couldn't go to the temple, but Jesus invites them into his little temple presence yep. that's traveling around now. Healing. And so Jesus, um, his, he's, he's so fully living in the world set up by the Hebrew Bible that he sees his true enemy. He'll go announce the kingdom of God in a city and demons are cast out and people are healed. And what he'll say in Luke chapter 10 is, I'm seeing the Satan fall from heaven. <laughs> so when people are freed from captivity to the internal Babylon and external Babylon and give their allegiance to Jesus and his new humanity and his love, they, the evil ones are being dethroned. Up until this point, this being, this entity, Satan, has owned everyone and everything. But I'm here to tell you that if you are a member of the kingdom of God, this being, Satan, has no claim on you at all. It's as though the prosecutor has been thrown out of court. God doesn't need to hear what you've done. He doesn't need to hear why you deserve death. He doesn't need to hear that death is your destiny. If you embrace me as Messiah and you join the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, problem solved. He has no claim on you at all. And so this, my ministry, my message, is the beginning of him losing ownership of the world. This is where it begins.
What spiritual warfare is, is the growth of the kingdom of God, the Great Commission, and the diminishing of the other kingdom. And the way that's accomplished is telling truth. You speak truth to lies. Of that, and that we all bow humbly under one king. Uh, I want this to eliminate division and help to bring unity here in the church in America and across the globe as we declare the victory that we have in Jesus, as we declare that he is Lord and King of the entire world. Uh, we are in this already but not yet kingdom. And I know there's suffering and so much uh, sorrow that we see across this world with war. But we can non-violently protest with hope, with prayer, with connection with each other, with looking out for the least of these, for the poor and the afflicted. Um, and we can do this together uh, in, in the power of the Spirit. Father, thank you for the truth that we have found in your word, for the victory that we have in your Son. I pray for everyone that hears this, that they can have hope uh, in, in the time of distress and the time of worry. They can know that ultimately they have victory in you and victory in Jesus. Help us to boldly proclaim this word to the nations. Help us to rest and wait uh, as you send your Son back into this world. Um, give us hope. Give us the, the unity that we desire, Father, because it only comes through you. Bless this channel. Bless everyone listening. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>